Welcome to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. I am your host, Molly Southgate, and today I'm interviewing... Daisy Bateman. Hi there. How are you doing today? I'm doing fine. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, I've been reading your book all day, and it is so excellent. I've been having so much fun trying to figure out who did it. (laughs) Oh, thank you. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Yeah, it's it's so great. Um, So can you actually tell the audience a little bit about it? Sure. Well, so A Dismal Harvest is the second book in my Marketplace Mysteries series. Um, It features uh, Claudia Simcoe, a former tech um, employee who has uh, chucked it all and moved to the Northern California coast to open a artisan foods marketplace. I apologize for my dog who wants to give his own description, Um, where uh, where she has to periodically solve murder mysteries um, in between eating a lot of the delicious foods that her... uh, tenants and other people in the area prepare. Yes. And that, that was actually one of my favorite parts of the book is um, all the food described in it. <laughs> that, it was great to um, hear about it because it was so, so vivid, the imagery that you used. Where, you. where did you get inspired to do that in this book? Um, I've always loved food writing, uh, back to Calvin Trillin that uh, my parents were fans of, and uh, and you know Anthony Bourdain's writing, and then a, and a lot of stuff in uh, in fiction as well. Actually, I was just reading one of my uh, favorite books of food writing. Oddly enough, is the Red Wall series, despite oh, the fact yes. that uh, most of the food would probably be terribly unpalatable. But I love the way he writes about it, and uh, it's great a great pleasure in it. So yeah, no, I like I like food and writing, and uh, it seemed like a thing to write about. That's so cool. You know, I, you know, I've, I've heard people say that before about Redwall, um, yeah. that it's one of those kind of like how Game of Thrones is kind of known for that too, where it's mm-hmm. like just so much great imagery used around what they're eating in it. Yeah. No, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. It's, it's, it's still violent. It's not that violent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can handle Game of Thrones, but I can, when it's mice, it's okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Kind of on that note, were there any books or movies that influenced this book? Well, so I was trying to think specific, not so much specifically. The uh, one of the central things in the book is a, uh, a hidden um, compartment in a wall, and I just love that sort of thing. Secret compartments, and you open and surprise, there's a thing. I don't know. I can't think of any specific examples beyond Scooby Doo, but I'm sure <laughs> I know. I've read I read lots of books that that include them. Um, Here's a great one to cite, especially for a mystery. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that that was, um, and then the the whole whole thing is, is sort of inspired by the the cozy genre in general, and uh, the kinds of things that that characters get up to, and wanting to see these these characters go on more adventures. Yeah, what was it like picking it back up for you? Because this is the second book in the series, um, and like kind of returning to these characters and getting back into the world. It was fun. I got to dig in a little bit more to a couple of, so in the first book, I sort of introduced everybody and we got to spend a little time with all of them. In this, in this book, I, I sort of dug in a little bit more with just a couple of, of the characters and, uh, and got, got a bit more into their lives and that they were doing. And so that was, that was fun to do and sort of look forward to moving around and doing that with, with various others of them um, later on, you know, work my way around the marketplace. Oh, that's really cool. When you were in like the pre-writing process for this, how did you decide like what what characters to kind of highlight for that? It developed kind of naturally, I think, from the um, you know, I I think I had a general idea for the plot first, and then it, because everything you know, I wanted to make sure it tied into the marketplace and the setting. So it was kind of like, well, here here I know who my victim is, who in this marketplace might have a connection to him, and then and so that I came up with who that might be, and I sort of worked from there. So I could uh, and that and that's kind of what what drove it. Cool. Yeah, that that was something that was something fun was kind of figuring out um, as I've been reading, trying to figure out who did it Um, (laughs) and kind of looking through and seeing like as you build um, all of these different like reasons for suspicion for the different people in the marketplace and just in the town in general. Yeah, I mean, it's tricky because this isn't really, you know, murders don't actually happen like this. So you have to come up with things that are plausible why, why there might be the five or six people who might want to murder somebody, but um, without without just resorting to well they were crazy. Yeah, 
and uh, like like you said, murders don't really happen like this. And um, I, I love how you kind of showed that in your character's frustration <laughs> at times with it. Like, why, why is this always around me? <laughs> <laughs> it's it's hard to get away. You know, it's the murder she wrote syndrome. How many people can can die in one small town? But yeah. you sort of have to. You kind of just have to go with it. It's it is it is the genre, and you know, you're 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 creating an alternate reality where this is something that happens, but. And I think there's no harm in kind of winking at it occasionally. Oh yeah. And and cozy mystery is almost put put it into a like like you said, it kind of puts it into an alternate reality, like a, a, a almost a fantasy mm-hmm. setting saying like, well, you just you need to have the suspension of disbelief there. Um right. in order to like fully get immersed. Then when you do, it's like the best thing and it's so much fun. Yeah, there's definitely no. It's not for everyone. Some there are some people who do find the 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 separation from reality uh, hard to take in cozies, but I really enjoy it. Mm, I I do as well. So, what is your character creation process like? It sort of varies. For so, my main character. I based very much on on myself and kind of what I would maybe more like to be a little bit. And then with obviously the flaws that you need for, for a character to be interesting. Um, so yeah, what she does is sort of me thinking, well, okay, what's, what seems like a thing to do in this situation. Um, and the other, other characters, it's kind of, nobody's really specifically based on anybody I know, but they're sort of my experiences with people. You know, that I, you think about someone who would be in this in this uh, position in their life and what they would have gone through and what sort of person that what, what sort of traits that would b- bring out in them. And what are people going to recognize in them? Because, you know, you can't you can't give a complete person, but you can give people enough to get them to connect to be like, oh, well, that woman, she has the traits of. These people I know, I understand who that is, sort of. Yes, absolutely. Um, that's that's something that I that I love hearing about char- about like character creation and noticing in writing of characters when it has that um, element to it where it's like, yeah, I feel like I know these people mm-hmm. um, because you give them like just enough traits to have that be the, <laughs> the thing. And one thing I think it's it's important not to be don't not being afraid to let people be a little weird because. People are a little, and so you can give people odd traits, and it's still okay. I mean, you know, it depends on how if over the top you're being, but uh, somebody being a very little off kilter in one way or another actually, I think, makes them more more believable than not. Yeah. What's one of your favorite, like, quirky or odd traits that you gave to one of your characters? Well, in this book, <laughs> there's uh, there, there's one character who I kind I, I quite like who has just a tremendous focus on vintage tractors. Yeah, that's, yes. that's that is that is the heart of his life and um and he thinks that there's there's nothing remotely strange about it and mm-hmm. has has sort of bent this entire museum towards his his love of these tractors um and i love that she says that too once she w- without giving too much away when she's at the when she meets the person and sees mm-hmm. the tractors how <laughs> it's just like this this moment of oh this is this is his thing yeah. <laughs> Um, probably, probably my favorite quirk that one of the characters had is all the bee puns. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sucker for puns, especially when they revolve around bees. <laughs> yes, yeah, sort of the bee crossed with the, the the very dad joke humor of that. I liked, I, I, I did enjoy writing him as well. He will definitely come back with more bee bee puns. <laughs> oh, I- amazing! <laughs> Did you put any Easter eggs in this book? And that that could be like to the first book or to any in general. So the, a little bit. I, I I hesitate to say too much because there, there's one in the first book that nobody has caught. Which so I'm a big fan of mystery science theater, and um, Rift Tracks is the follow on. If you're familiar with that, it's a it was a mystery science theater was an old television show where people made fun of terrible movies. Oh, and it's, it's so good. And there's a and there's a modern version where the same people are still making fun of terrible movies, but without puppets. Um, so there was there is a line in the first book that is a, a very specific reference to a, a famous line from a mystery science theater riff, which I'm just waiting for somebody to catch. And then there's a character in the second book who is named after a, ter- a director of very bad movies. <laughs> <laughs> so Ooh, that, I'll have to I'll have to look out for that. Relatively one. common name, so it's really sort of only an Easter egg for me. But uh, 
<laughs> but but if any, anyone who who is who watches a lot of riff tracks and knows that that's there can probably pick it out. Oh, but that's so cool. There probably won't be very many people. But that's awesome. It's those kind of niche things that give a book character. Mm-hmm. Um, so what was your outlining process like for this book and did it change at all from how it was in the first book? Um, it did change a bit. I did I for this book since I I had a publisher, I had to pitch it. So I had to write a reasonably complete synopsis of the book before, before I, wrote I wrote it. it. Um so the first book I didn't quite, I had just sort of an idea, but not really a formal synopsis or outline. Um, it did change. It changed some. I knew that I, the, the victim didn't change the, the killer sort of changed. And, um, of, of, of some of the details in the middle, uh, changed a bit, but the, 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 I did, I did know for certain what the final, the uh, dramatic final scene would be even before I figured out how to write it. Um, Ooh, that's that's really cool. But uh, that uh, that 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 would be too much of a spoiler. Oh yeah, um, w- without spoiling, like without spoiling anything. Um, what was it like writing something with where the killer changes? Because that's that's a pretty dramatic thing to have. Um, like for the for the writing process, I would imagine. Did you have to like go back and change anything, or like how did that how did that come to you that it needed to be someone else? Um, well, I didn't. I, cha- I basically I, I had too many characters, and I con- I consolidated two of them. Um, so somebody the, the the killer and not the killer. Um, so it didn't change tremendously. I had to go back and change some things, but it wasn't the the motive remained the same, and um, most of the setup. I just you know there there was there was an extraneous character there. So now you're one person instead of two, um, and and also you're the murderer. Surprise! Oh yeah. <laughs> It wasn't a huge change of direction for the book. It was just, this needs to be slightly different than what it is. Ah, that makes sense. Kind of on that note, have you ever had to kill any of your darlings in your writing? Um, And if so, do you have like a, do you have like one big one that's kind of (laughs) always gotten to you? Because I know a lot of times authors have like one that it's like, I had to, I had to get rid of this character this many years ago. (laughs) <laughs> nothing, nothing that haunts me to the quite that extent. But one, the book, one book that I, one that actually was never published. That probably is what haunts me the most. Was that that book? Um, there, there were some, there was issues with the publisher, and it never actually came out. But in the course of writing it, um, I got halfway in and realized my plot was completely wrong, and I had I threw out just a huge amount. Um, and, and basically had to, had to tear up the whole thing and start over. So there were, there was lots of good stuff in there that I really liked, but it just, the book just didn't work. So I had to, I had to go in, I, but I did to, to make myself feel better was I, I created a separate word document where every time I cut stuff out, I just put it there. So I wasn't getting rid of it. I could save it. Maybe later or someday I could use that. I, I love that so much. I, I, I do that because um, I, I write like poetry and stuff. And a lot of times I'm just constantly deleting lines. Um, and so I'm just I just kind of shove them into into my notes app because I can't bear to I can't bear to get rid of all of it. What if there was something you could use later? Yeah, no, I just, it just it feels it, it's easier than if it's just sitting there and it's I know it's not gone. <laughs> mm hmm. When you're writing, do you feel like you have to be in a specific environment or can you just kind of write wherever? I try to be able to write wherever. Um, I find it's if I if I get too precious about my environment, it just becomes an excuse not to write. Um, I do generally have put music on and headphones. I can't have too much in the way of distraction, but I write mostly at the kitchen table, at the dining room table, and otherwise largely on the ferry, um, that where I commute to work on a ferry. So, and yeah, I, I, I try to be, I try to be as flexible as possible about the environment. Cool. What, what kind of music do you usually listen to? Uh, it's largely pop, uh, just kind of everything I've acquired in my iTunes over all of the years. I'm, I think I'm the last person in the world who doesn't listen to their music on streaming. Uh, that's that's nice though um, that you that you're able to listen to because I know some people can't do lyrics when they're writing. Yeah, no, I've heard I've heard a lot of people say that, but I think I kind of like the distraction. I'm big on distractions. Me too. I, I get that way, um, and, and then I just end up tuning out the lyrics anyway, and it, it always helps me focus better. Mm-hmm. So, 
how did you decide to develop the characters' relationships throughout this? Because there are some that definitely, um, without giving too much away, develop. <laughs> um, and like, did you, was that kind of the plan from the beginning or did it change as you were writing? So I definitely planned to have the the relationships develop um, in this book. It actually it cha- mostly changed because I wrote it and I sent it off to my agent, and she said, and she came back with like, "Well, you have you say all of this about the relationship, but all I see here is two people being kind of awkward near each other." I thought I wrote romance. No, okay. Um, so I just took out the part where I said that there was really sort of, um, and yeah, I I, to- I I toned down any claims that this was a romantic evening. <laughs> And uh, I it t- thought it was. I thought it was romantic. <laughs> I, I, I think the, the the lesson here is that I do not have a future as a romance writer. Oh my goodness! <laughs> well, see, I was. I I don't read that much romance, and I was reading this, going like, "Oh, the romance is so cute in this book." <laughs> yeah. See, yeah, th- I feel like there there are people who 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 can relate. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know this is kind of a tricky question, but out of if you had to pick one thing out of every part of it, what is your favorite element of a mystery? And this can be writing it or reading or watching or anything. <laughs> yeah, writing is writing it is definitely the part where it's done. Um, <laughs> reading, I would get I guess I would say the mysteries themselves. Um, I'm big Agatha Christie fan. I really like a t- a, a very tightly constructed plot. I, I aspire to to that level of of just kind of, you know, watch craftsmanship uh everything fits together very nicely and it uh it, it's just very satisfying when you get to the end and you and it's 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 clear how it works but it wasn't obvious to you until you saw it mm-hmm. um, yeah so and then of course, characters and, and di- the dial i mean you have to have everything else but i think that's why i read mysteries as opposed to uh, other genres yeah definitely I, I i also love mysteries and that's one of my favorite things is getting to see that kind of unveiling at the end. (laughs) So what was it like for you picking up this series again and getting back into the headspace of these characters? It was great. I really, I really enjoyed, uh, you know, getting, getting reacquainted with the, with the characters and the, and the location and uh, thinking of, thinking of more ways for things to go wrong for, for Claudia and her marketplace and uh, finding places to hide frogs. (laughs) Yes. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, no, I mean, you know, because I, I gave, I because I'd already created all the, the characters. I, I then it was I could have a little bit more fun with them now that I knew them, and they could be kind of more organic. And, and when they when I wrote about them, so that was a lot of fun. Mm, that's really cool. In this book, like when while you were writing it. Did you set anything up for future things that could go wrong for Claudia and her market? <laughs> yes, actually, at the very end, there is quite a setup that that uh, that that. I, I can say no more, but uh, it, it it ends with a thing happening that it's not it's not a cliffhanger. The book itself is complete, but there is there is definitely an, a a development that would could make things interesting for her in the future. Oh well, I'll be I'll be there very soon, so <laughs> so I'm excited to see what happens. Yeah, I actually want to talk a little bit more about the setting um, because you expanded a bit in this book with certain as you're saying earlier i'm trying to figure out how to skate around the spoilers but um certain secret hideaways and things like that um did it change like how you viewed the marketplace and the the world in there at large or did you have that like already in the back of your mind that was, that was gonna no the, the the history aspect of it i definitely it was new was new in this book i hadn't really thought about why there was this barn here on on, on the, the the california coast that had been converted into a marketplace in the first book it simply existed and it was an old barn and now it was a marketplace and so you know, that was that was an interesting thing to do to think about okay who owned this before what what sort of what li- kind of lives had it had before it became what it is now and how does that then play forward in the story do you think that later in your writing you would want to explore the history of other parts of the town some more or is that something that you kind of feel you've already completed 
No, I think there's there's a lot to be uh, to 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 be considered there. I mean, I think I will continue to be writing contemporary stories, but I think there there can be interesting mis- aspects, particularly for a mystery of things that have happened in the past. And uh, the it's not quite a wild west town, but it had had some a town that could have had some wilder days in its history and some interesting characters that we can learn about. Um, I, I recently finished reading a book called In the Shadow of Memory by Connie Berry, which is so good. Um, uh, a mystery like this one. Um, and in it, it kind of put in a lot of elements of the history around it and like looking back at like the past. And it kind of it kind of reminded me of of this one um, when I, as I was as I was reading this, it was it was fun to kind of read those two back to back and see like, oh, there's all these things happening here. but this one takes place in a completely different setting and completely different, <laughs> different <laughs> everything else, but um, still getting that same feeling that you're kind of learning something new about this um, setting and what happened here before. <laughs> it has been so great to talk with you today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thank you for having me. It's been great to talk to you. I just have one last question. Um, and that is, what do you have coming up? Um, nothing is immediately planned. I'm currently working on Margaret Place book number three, but there's no uh, publication date for it. So, uh, but some of that, some of some of that history actually is is playing into it. So I'm. It's, this is a very appropriate conversation now. Ooh, cool. Well, I'm so excited to read it when it comes out. Good luck with all the publishing and everything with that. Um, once again, thanks so much for read between the lines. My name is Molly Southgate. I'm Daisy Bateman. Let's end this the way all great stories end. Happily ever after. The end. (laughs) Thank you for listening to Read Between the Lines, a book podcast. You can follow the show on Instagram and Facebook at Read Between the Lines podcast and on Twitter at RBTL podcast. Make sure to follow the authors who I've been talking to to hear all about their upcoming projects and also because they're cool people. This show is hosted by me, Molly Southgate, and produced and edited by my dad, Rob Southgate. Read Between the Lines is a Southgate Media Group production, and you can find all the great content put on by the network at southgatemediagroup.com. You can read the story of how I and many other podcasters started in the anthology book Pod Life, which you'll find at the link in the show notes. Also in the show notes are links to buy the books featured on this episode. Using those links supports this show and the incredible authors being interviewed. Have a great week and keep reading.